Hello everybody! Today I'm going to show you how to build an entire game room like this one. One that has pretty much every console hooked up and ready to play. I will get deep into the details including how to wire everything, where to get these things, what these things are, how to build the shelves, how to make a mini console stand, how to arrange the LED lights, how to hang your portable systems on the wall, where to get these retro themed posters, and a whole lot of other stuff. It'll all be done in chapters, each one set to the background music of a classic video game. Before we get into it, ask yourself, do you really want to build something like this? It's an enormous time investment to build, will cost you an arm and a leg, and you may not even have time to enjoy it when you're done. I don't want to sound discouraging, but you need to think about these things beforehand. Do you really want to be like me? Look at me, I'm freaking crazy. Of course, many of you aren't here to replicate the setup. But instead, you want to borrow a few aspects of it. To that end, in the comments section, I'll post timestamps, so you'll be able to jump to whatever chapters you want to see. I'll also be very active in the comments on this one, so if you have a question or suggestion, post it. So let's get on with it. The first thing you'll need to think about if you're building one of these game rooms from scratch is what room to put it in. You may not have too many choices. I was fortunate enough to buy a house that had four bedrooms, so I did have some choices to make. I went with the one that is 13 feet by 15 feet. The shelving I have the video game set up on takes up half the walls in the room, as indicated by the blue rectangles there. There was a closet in the room that I disassembled and just opened it up a little bit. I haven't done too much with the space yet. You'll want to think about how many power outlets you need. And if you haven't built the room yet, you might want to have more installed. I have a total of five in the room, and here's the location of all of them. Something else you'll want to think about is internet access. You'll want at least a good Wi-Fi signal, but if you play a lot of online multiplayer games, you'll want to put in a LAN cable if the room doesn't have one already. This is one I installed myself. Obviously, there's a lot of slack in the cord, which I'm going to take care of eventually. It was hard to buy a cord exactly the length that I needed it to be. The more built-in lights that you have in the room, the better. I replaced a ceiling fan with a LED dome light, and since I have that, I don't have to use a power outlet to light the room. I advise against using the basement as a video game room if you have that choice. There's more moisture overall in basements, which could harm the electronics within your games, but perhaps you have things in place to take care of that moisture. I also saw a statistic on the internet that 90% of basements will eventually flood at some point in their lifetimes. So that's something you want to consider too, that would be quite a disaster. The most important thing you should think about is the sun. If you let the sun beam into your room, it'll fade your consoles and your collection. I have two windows in this room, one is behind the setup here and one is on this wall, and I have them completely blocked with cardboard. Let me remove this cardboard and show you what it looks like if the sun shines into the room. As you can see, it's hitting my consoles directly. That's not a good thing. Obviously, you can block a lot of it out with a very thick curtain. I wanted a curtain that blends in with the wall perfectly, so I didn't want a big, puffy, thick curtain. You can actually see an image of the window burned into the cardboard, which shows how big an effect the sun can have. I didn't even know it was there until I took it out for this video. So a lot of people think it's very tacky to have cardboard in your windows and it's going to make your house look terrible from the outside. The truth of the matter is, this window right here has the cardboard in it. It's hard to tell that it's actually cardboard because of the reflections 
and the screen and everything basically looks like a curtain from the outside. Now this is a second story window. If it's the first story, perhaps if someone got up close, they would realize what was going on. If that's a concern, there is another option. You can use masking tape to create fake blinds by just putting it on there horizontally. And I'm doing a test here on a very small piece of cardboard to see how it would look. And it actually looks exactly like blinds from the outside. Once again, this is a second story window, but I believe it would be just as convincing if it was on the first story. And here's a window that actually has real blinds in it. So as you can see, it's quite the same. If you want it even more realistic looking, you can draw the little string lines onto the fake blinds. This test was so convincing to me that I'm actually going to convert my big cardboard in my video game room into fake blinds. Temperature is another thing to think about. You obviously don't want to play games in an uncomfortable hot room. If you're in the northern hemisphere, a room on the south side of your house should be cooler than the ones on the north side because they don't get hit with as much direct sun. And that's all I have to say about this subject. On to the next chapter. Okay, so let's talk about the wire shelving that I use. My setup measures 72 inches high, 140 inches wide, and 18 inches deep. Now that deepness of 18 inches is the most crucial part of this setup. Without that, I wouldn't have enough space to put the controllers in front of the systems. I think it's the biggest mistake that people make when they build their gaming setups. They get shelves that are not wide enough. So make sure you keep that in mind. Now the kind I'm using, I bought from Lowe's. It's called Style Selections 18 inch blah blah blah. I'll put the entire name on the screen, but basically it's a five tier wire shelving. A set of five costs about $80. And what I did is bought six total sets. So I spent a total of 480 bucks. I did not do this all at one time though. I slowly bought more and more shelves over the years and added it to the existing setup. So the configuration that I have these wire shelves in are not how they are sold. As mentioned, they sell them in sets of five shelves. I bought multiple kits and merged them together. And I end up with 16 shelves on one wall and 14 on the other. That $80 at Lowe's is the lowest price I can find for these shelves. If you go to other places, you can find these same shelves for a lot more. So hopefully if you go this route, you have a Lowe's in your area or you have a Lowe's that you can order from. You can also buy individual shelves at Lowe's in case you're one short. These kind of shelves are adjustable and they obviously have a lot of breathing space for the electronics. And the best thing about it is that you can tie wiring to it. It's not quite how manufacturers intended for it to be used, but out of all the choices I had, this one was the best to fit the kind of game room that I wanted to have. In a few minutes, I'll suggest some alternatives. Basically, to put these together, you have these rods that hold up the shelves and you put these black spacers on them and you configure them however you want. And you place the shelves on the spacers and then you tap them down with a mallet and you can use a leveler to make sure you have it level. A lot of people do not like the look of these shelves, and I can understand that. There's obviously other ways to go about it. If you're really good with wood, you may be able to build one yourself. But just make sure that the shelf is deep enough. I suggest you do a Google image search for shelving, and also go on Wayfair and search on entertainment centers. Here's a cool one on Wayfair. It's called the Pratich, uh, I can't say it, Entertainment Center. And this one is only 16 inches deep, which is two inches less deep than mine, but it might still be enough. It obviously looks really cool. I don't think it would be enough to hold my systems. If I got this, I would have to mod it to have more shelves, but this is $1,300. 
But like I said, I recommend you look through Wayfair and see what you can find. The thing about wire shoving is that things can fall through them, like controllers and games, and you obviously don't want that to happen. So you have to put some shelf liners on these. And for me, I use two different types of shelf liners. I use one that's tough, and I use another one that's more rubbery that keeps things from sliding around. On most of my shelves, I put one layer of each of these. Underneath the TV, I have more than one layer because I need more toughness to it to hold the heavy TV. So the hard liner that I use is called Intro Metro Clear Shelf Liner 18 by 48. It's already cut and sized to my shelves. There is some plastic that can be peeled off of it if you want to. On top of that, I place something called Plasto Mat Ribbed Shelf Liner. And for that, I do have to cut the size. And once again, that top layer just keeps things from sliding around. And I'll just mention one other thing. I have a heat vent that is underneath one of my shelves. And I don't want that heat to get up into my game systems. So on the shelf that's above that heat vent, I added two layers of reflective insulation. I also need to talk about the TV stand that's underneath my CRT. That is one I bought in the late 90s. I think I bought it at the same time I bought my TV. Since they don't make CRT TVs, I cannot imagine they're still making stands like these anymore. So if you need one, I recommend you go to Craigslist or go to th some thrift stores or just build something. I think a CRT TV like this would be too heavy to put directly onto the wire shoving, which is why it has its own separate stand. So anyway, I'm done with this segment. Let's move on to the next one. You've probably already noticed that I have trays underneath most of my consoles. They make the systems more presentable and they allow me to tuck the controller cords underneath them. A long time ago, I bought these from an office store. It was either Office Max or Office Depot. They are called Honeyware Ready Shelves. However, many years ago, I could not find them anymore. And then I discovered they were being sold under a different name online called Walter Drake Snap Together Shelves. So do a search on that and you will find them available on many sites including Amazon. Now I will say they are expensive, a lot more expensive than when I first bought mine. Inside the package are rods and I just toss those out because you can just take two of the shelves and put them together to form the tray that I use for my consoles. Now you have to be careful, there are some sharp edges on the plastic, so you can use sandpaper to wear it down a little bit. Not every system will fit perfectly into these. For example, on this one I have to use some VCR tapes to prop it up because the system is just bigger than the tray. These do come available in white, and I think I would recommend that over the black because the black does show dust. If it's white, it's going to be much harder to see the dust, so you'll have to dust less often. In addition to the trays, I also have a couple pedestals that I have underneath the Ouya and the Hyperscan. For those, I basically cut some squares out of wood and glued them together and then I painted it. This is just something specific that I needed because the Ouya was kind of behind the controllers to begin with. And the same thing with the Hyperscan, so I needed them to be elevated. So that's all I have to say about that. Let's go on to the next segment. So I mentioned earlier that some consoles don't fit those black trays. That's really true with the mini consoles. So for those, I built a pair of giant trays to put them on. So right here is what the underside looks like, and I'm just going to put the dimensions on the screen. So there's a rod down here. The purpose of that is to lean the controllers against. And you should be able to buy those at the hardware store. I bought ones that are 1 and 1 8 by 36 inches. 
The thing is, it needed to be longer than 36 inches, so I actually had to glue two of those together. By the way, at the hardware store, they're called wood dowels. For the rest of it, I just bought some pine and I cut it and I screwed it together. And then I gave it a couple of coats of red paint. That is the same color of my wall. So this allows you to tuck the controller cords into them and give it a nice presentation. If you have any questions about this, just ask me in the comments. So let's talk about the centerpiece of any game room, and that is the television, or in my case, televisions. The newer one is a 49-inch 4K LED TV, manufactured in 2019. One of the big considerations you need to make is how many inputs you have on the back and what kind of inputs. If you're going to be using any systems that output component, then you'll want to find a TV that obviously has component inputs. And this one does. A lot of manufacturers don't put these kind of inputs on the back of the TVs anymore. So just make sure you're looking very carefully. Also, if you play a lot of modern systems you'll want a lot of HDMI inputs. This one has three. I wish it had more than that. Another thing you have to consider when getting a modern TV is the lag time. There's some sites out there and some YouTube channels where people measure the lag time of all the new televisions on the market. This one has 11 milliseconds of lag in game mode which is excellent. My other TV is a 32 inch JVC CRT TV that was made in 1999 and I purchased it in the store in 1999 and it still works today. A lot of people like to upgrade their old systems to play on newer TVs to get a graphical upgrade and because they sometimes don't have a CRT sitting around. I chose not to take that path, at least at this point, because I'm very satisfied with the way my setup is now. I just like playing on the old TV that I've had for 21 years. It has a low level of lag and the systems that are hooked up to it were made to be played on it. So you get a very authentic experience. Of course, finding a CRT today is a little bit harder to do since they, they stopped manufacturing them years ago but you should still be able to find a lot of them they're on craigslist they're in thrift stores i advise everyone out there to preserve as many of them as possible if you have the space for them of course if you're going the crt route you'll want to consider the inputs that are on the back of the tv i strongly advise you get one with a s video input a lot of the old systems look very good with the S-Video output and it could be done very cheaply. And also you'll want to make sure you have the yellow composite input. A lot of very old CRTVs will not have any of these things. So before you pick something up by the curb, just take a look at the back. Mine also has audio out, which I'll be taking advantage of in the future when I add a sound system to the room. The quantity of inputs is important too. I have two sets of inputs total and if I'm using S video on input one I can't really use the composite at the same time so all my composite systems go through input two the more you have the simpler things are going to be if you are looking for a CRT TV I do recommend this JVC one that I have and if you're really lucky you can find the 36 inch version of it and here's the model numbers for the 36 inch version that would be ideal and if I ever had an opportunity to get one of those I would get it in a heartbeat so that's all I have to say about TVs. Obviously people have different preferences, but for me the dual TV setup of my video game room is something I enjoy a lot. So let's move on to the next chapter. So this segment is mostly going to be common sense, but if I didn't talk about this, it would be very weird. So if you're going to have a game room, you obviously have to buy some systems. For me, I chose to buy most of the American ones that I can get my hands on, but I did not go for Japanese only releases or European only releases. Now I do have a couple of Japanese consoles that are Japanese versions of ones that released in America, like the Apple Pippin. So anyway, you have to create your own set of rules and then just go with it. 
For me, I mostly used eBay, and I bought these a long time ago. A lot of them have increased in price, so that may not be feasible for a lot of people. Now you may also want to consider clone systems, especially if you don't have a CRT TV. You may also want to get a Raspberry Pi, or you may want to have some original hardware, clone systems, and a Raspberry Pi. If you are buying old consoles, you will probably not have any problem getting the most common ones, like a Sega Genesis or an NES. Now, if you are handy with repairing electronics, you'll be able to get things for cheaper because you can buy them broken and then just fix them. Or perhaps you buy multiple broken ones and just exchange their parts. There's a lot of tutorials on YouTube on how to do basic soldering and uh, switching out capacitors and stuff like that. The more you learn that, the more money you're going to save if you're buying the old consoles. So that's all I have to say about that. Just set some limits, get some money, and make it happen. It's time to talk about electricity. It's a crucial component of a game room, obviously, and it takes a lot of planning if you're gonna do a game room like mine. So, as I noted earlier, I have five power outlets in the room. Three of them are used to power my main setup. There's close to a hundred things in this room that need power, so obviously getting that much from just a few outlets is a logistical challenge. But you can make it happen if you buy a bunch of extension cords. I'm talking about a large variety of them. I use a lot of eight foot cords, but I also use ones that are one foot long. Another thing I had to use is splitters, and what these are is they take the electrical line and split it into two. There's links to all these in the description. But the most important component is the rack mount power supply. What these do is they take power from the wall and distribute it among eight or nine different outlets on the back of it. And each one of those outlets has a switch. So whenever you're not using something, it is completely off because the switch is off. I bought them over a series of years and they have come out with different models. Some have eight plugs and some have nine and some are black and some are silver. If you're going to get the newest edition, just be sure to read the reviews on Amazon. There are some people that believe these are fire hazards, but I do keep an eye on them and when they're being used, I do feel to see how hot the different components are getting. To plug systems into the back of these rack mount power supplies, you're going to need the small one foot extension cords. That's because AC adapters are very large and you can't plug them directly into the back. These extension cords allow me to just set the AC adapters onto the rack at the top. With all the extension cords, the splitters and rack mount power supplies and everything else I just mentioned, I created this electrical network. And this basically shows how power is distributed from my three outlets to the different rack mount power supplies. I could not have created anything like this if I had not made a chart. I have a power strip that I use to power all the mini consoles. Since those don't consume that much power, I had no problem just putting them all onto one power strip and then plugging that power strip into the back of my rack mount power supply. For those of you who are concerned about electrical safety, I would just say take it one step at a time, test everything, see if the cords get too warm, make sure you're using really thick cords, and just use common sense. Having everything turned off by the buttons on the rack mount power supply is a safety feature. Before I leave the room, I can look up there and see if any buttons are lit up and see if I left anything on. That being said, some of the light bulbs and some of the buttons no longer work, so I will have to replace those. So that's all I have to say about electricity. If you have any questions, put them in the comments.
Now I'm going to talk about the signal cords. I'm talking about the cords that go from the systems to the TV. I have a very complex network and I'm going to go over every little detail. So I have a variety of signals that I use in this room. I use RF, composite, S-video, component, and HDMI. And I'm just gonna hone in on each of those and talk about them individually. Let's first talk about S-video. I have about 11 systems set up to output S-video, but I only have one S-video input on the back of my TV. So how do you get 11 all the way to that one port? Well, it's complicated. I use a series of switch boxes and I use two different kinds total. The back of a switch box has multiple inputs and one output, which basically means you can hook multiple systems up and have their signal go out one set of cords into the TV. I use this one which has five inputs on it and I'll just put the name on the screen. And I use this one made by the same company that has four inputs. So this is what the network looks like. The arrows are just the direction in which the signals are traveling. On the right are the four input switch boxes, and then on the left is the five input switch box. I have three consoles that connect to the five one, but for the other two inputs, those come from the other switch boxes. And if you just look at this diagram, it should make sense. I will say, when I get to the part of the video that talks about recording, there is another wrinkle to this network, and it's very complex and I'm not gonna put it on the screen yet. I'll save that for when I'm talking about recording. I have about 10 systems that output composite and they pretty much use the exact same diagram as the S-Video one, a total of three switch boxes. It's three different switch boxes than the S-Video one, but it works the same way. Once again, I have it set up where I can record the composite. I'll just mention that there's a couple of VCR based systems in this setup, and the way they are hooked up to the TV is so complex that I've forgotten how I've done it. And I actually knew I was going to forget it because I wrote out how it's connected and I have it on this piece of paper in the setup. The two VCR based systems are very complex to hook up, especially in a network this big. So now I'm going to jump over to the HDMI network and that's obviously hooked up to my modern TV. For that, I use these Kinevo switch boxes. I actually have two different kinds. Two of them are a 501BN and one is a 550BN. The 550 one is geared for the most modern consoles. I have about 16 systems that are sending out HDMI. It was very hard to get that into three different switch boxes. So since I only have three HDMI inputs on the back of my TV, I have one box for each of them. I had to buy a small small mechanical HDMI switch that takes in two different HDMI systems and sends them out to the one of the Kinevos. That little one is just a three port HDMI switch. For HDMI, I do have it set up where I can record from the network. I will get into that on the chapter about recording. Let's talk about the RF systems and that's what is outputted by most old systems. I do have a Atari 2600 that's been modded to output composite because I'm a big fan of the 2600. But for all the other old systems, they output RF. And in the past, I used to have a switch box that networked those. But in my dealings, RF does not respond well to switch boxes. RF is already a weak signal and sending it through a switch box seems to weaken it even more. So I decided to go with a simple plug and play system. What that means is all the different RF systems send their cords to this little area that's down here to the right of my TV. when I want to play one of those systems, I plug it into this input that goes to the TV right here. These cords that I use are basically called RCA, or sometimes they're called composite. They all kind of have the same connector. I'll put some little components that are useful on the screen. 
Now some of these things are useful for not just RF, but for composite and component as well. They basically allow you to make extended cables so that you can reach the switch boxes. Now one thing you don't want to do is make your extensions too long. You want to make them just long enough to reach where you want them to go. If a cord is too long, the signal will start to degrade. Lastly, I'm going to talk about component. And I actually do the same thing as I do with RF. I have five systems that output component, and whenever I want to play one, I just switch it up with a little adapter interface I have underneath the TV. And once again, this is because I've had trouble with component switch boxes. Right now, I'm eyeing a new one, and I might experiment with that in the future. So that's all I have to say about the signal network. Let's move on to the next segment. So now I'm going to talk about controllers, specifically on how to get them situated for a setup like this one. In order for the controllers to reach the center of the room where I play my games, I have to extend a lot of the controller cords. Basically I look at the system that I have and just do a eBay search or an Amazon search and just find the extension cable for that particular system. There's a lot of controllers out there with cords that have a 9-pin connector, and those kind of extensions are very easy to find. Most of the others are proprietary, so you just gotta do some shopping and some keyword searching and find the controller extensions that you need. I will say there are some options to play some of these systems wirelessly now, but I haven't made an attempt to use any of those. So, on to the next segment. Okay, let's talk about the LED lights. I have LED lights on pretty much every part of these shelves. I can use a remote to change them to any color, and I can also make them blink and phase out and so forth. I hooked them up using twisty ties. There's also a sticky backing on the back of them. I use that to hang them up as well. Now here's the thing about this segment. I'm going to actually discourage you from doing things the way I did it. I got a little bit carried away. This is way too many lights. In fact, if I try to play a game while I have them all on, the circuit breaker will actually break. Here's some footage of it actually happening to me. There's a lot of other drawbacks too. I mentioned the stickiness that's on the back of them. Now that tends to gather a bunch of dust, dirt, and cat hair, and all kinds of other stuff. So you'll be constantly picking some of that off. I tried removing the glue from the back a million different ways and I could not do it. It's like the strongest glue in the world. If you don't want to expose the stickiness, you can leave the paper backing on the back of it, but then you're seeing that brown backing all the time. It doesn't look that good. Another drawback to having this many is it's way too bright. There's no way to play a game with these on. If you keep these on while you're playing a game, you'll burn your eyes out. A lot of these light strips I bought off Amazon and they have failed a lot. There's certain segments that just stop working. So I have to cut those bad sections out. So yeah, there's a lot of drawbacks. If you're going to do something like this, I recommend you don't do as many. And I also recommend you don't put them on the setup itself. Maybe put it along the top of the wall or something, just to give some color to the entire room. That's all I have to say about LED lights, so let's move on to the next segment. You cannot have a video game room without Cheetah Girls for the Game Boy Advance. It is the best video game ever made. You better get it now before the prices of the game go up. Your goal in the game is to make yourself famous, and you do that by doing a lot of fun things. 
eventually you'll start performing at concerts, and that's where the game really gets intense. These are some of the best soundtracks that have ever been existed on the Earth. It's like blast processing, but on steroids. You will never forget this game. You will play it the rest of your life and never play another single game. So that's all I have to say about Cheetah Girls. Let's move on to the next chapter. So let's talk about recording video. In case you don't know, I do game reviews on this channel from time to time. To do that, I capture video onto my laptop straight from this setup for a lot of the systems in the room, including the S-Video ones, the composite ones, the component ones, and the HDMI ones. I wanted it to be as easy as possible for me to just walk up and record something. And to that end, I did some really complicated things with the wiring of this setup. If I want to record S-Video, I just walk up to the setup and plug my laptop into the Dazzle recording device that is set up behind my TV. I also have to flick some switches to turn some things on. The signals that are coming from the switch box to the TV get split up. The audio gets split up using these splitting cords I have on the screen right now. One set of signals goes to the TV and one set of signals goes to the Dazzle. In order to split the S-Video, I use a cord that splits S-Video. But on its way to the Dazzle, it gets enhanced by uh, amplifier, if you will. That's actually a splitter, but I don't use it to split. I just use it to continue the signal. And it sends that signal to the Dazzle. So if I want to record composite, it's a little bit different. What I do is I take whatever device I want to record and plug it into this splitter. And one set of signals goes to the TV and one set of signals goes to the laptop. So there is a little bit of plugging and unplugging I have to do to record composite. This diagram shows how it works. Here's the splitter that I use. For the more modern games on the modern TV, I use an Elgato to record. If I'm going to record an HDMI system, I unplug its connection to the Kinevo, and then I plug it into the Elgato capture device, which is connected to my laptop. And that signal splits and goes into my laptop, and it actually goes into my third Kinevo device, and that sends its signal to the TV. I know, it's a little complicated. And component kind of works the same way. I, there's a component connection to the Elgato. Whenever I want to record a component system, I disconnect it where I would normally connect it to and plug it into the Elgato. And Elgato actually converts that to an HDMI signal and sends it to the TV. So hopefully that all made sense. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Let's move on to the next segment. So this is going to be a very short chapter. I just want to mention a few little devices I have uh, connected to this setup. For one thing, I have a battery charger that kind of hangs out the right side of the setup. And I need a constant supply of fresh batteries for certain controllers like the Xbox 360 and the Ouya, which I play a lot of, and also the handhelds. Most of them take the same battery type. I have that charger connected to a single switch on the rack mount. I also have many things that charge controllers, including the Wii U gamepad and the PS4 controllers and the PS3 controllers. And once again, I have those charging devices plugged directly into the rack mount. So when I want to charge something, I just flick the button on the rack mount. And also since I have a Wii U and a Wii, they each have a sensor bar. I have one of them above the TV and one of them below it. I have attached them to the chrome shelves. The little cords on those things are very fragile and I'm glad I have a stationary setup where I don't have to move those things around. So that's all I have to say about the little gadgets of my setup. Let's move on to the next chapter.
Master. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about the cable management that I did. I used a lot of black twisty ties and also Velcro to tie up all the cords to the back of the setup. A lot of people don't like that they can still see the wiring. I like to have access to it and to me it doesn't look that bad. It just looks like a nervous system. A lot of people want me to cover them up with a curtain or something. That isn't feasible and I don't like the idea of putting cloth on the gaming setup due to something potentially catching fire. I want it to be open to the air. Other people think I should hide the cords using coverings. I don't think that's feasible in a setup like this. Coverings like that are only good if you have wires going from one place to another place before they disband. The wiring in this setup tends to go all over the place and it needs to go in different directions and so forth. It's hard to contain it in a small set of coverings, if that makes sense. There's a lot of wires that are along the ground, along the back of the setup, and they are just hidden from view. It's important to have large places to hide things. You can see here what it looks like behind my LED TV. It's like a waterfall of cords. In other words, I only tie up the things that are visible. So that's all I had to say about cable management. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. On to the next chapter. So let's talk about the Vetrix and the Virtual Boy. These things are unlike any of the other systems in the room. They are kind of portable, but they are not handhelds, basically. I have them displayed on something called a console table, and that is the actual name of it. A console table is a table that's high and thin, as opposed to a coffee table that is short and covers more space. I ordered it from Wayfair and it was very easy to put together. And if you own these two systems, this kind of table is perfect. One thing about the Vetrix, in case you don't know, is that the games are not in color unless you have an overlay on them. So each game has its own overlay, and I have those hung on the wall beside the table. At any time, I can take one off the wall and put it on the Vetrex. In order to get them hung up on the wall, I bought these pins that have magnets on them, and you push them into the wall, and then you take this other magnet and use it to hang up your stuff, basically. These are very powerful magnets. The overlays have never fallen off. And I should also mention that I store the different games for the Vetrex and Virtual Boy in this display that's screwed onto the wall. I thought I bought this from Amazon, but I couldn't find a record of the order, so I'm not sure where I bought this. But it's made out of acrylic, and it's a display shelf of some sort. That's all I have to say about the Vetrex and the Virtual Boy. I like the way that it worked out, and if you have those two systems, I recommend you do something similar to this. Let's jump to the next chapter. So let's talk about the portable systems that I have on the wall. I used some floating shelves. I ordered them from Amazon. And I just attached them to the wall. They actually come with a leveler to help you install them. These little shelves are kind of expensive, but they're perfect for the handhelds. I adjusted the spacing when I was installing the shelves so that the larger handhelds could be at the top and the smaller ones can be at the bottom. Now the thing is, these are wide and a lot of the small handhelds don't fit well in them. For that, I have a red rod in the back that makes the space smaller so that the handheld can sit in there snugly. That rod is something I bought directly from the hardware store. It's called a poplar wood dowel. And I basically just painted it the same color as the wall, which helps it blend in. So yeah, I, these floating shelves came out very nice. So that's all I have to say about these handhelds. Let's move on. So 
so let's talk about the furniture in the room. I have two different types of ottomans made by the same company, and one is large and one is small, and I can keep things on the inside of them if I want to. They're very comfortable, but there are some strings that are coming loose from it, and it's happening more and more often. I have to keep trimming them. They should last a while, but I don't think they'll last forever. But they were cheap, and I got them from Amazon. I also have these gaming chairs. It's good to have a chair on wheels in this room because I have consoles along two different walls. Now are these chairs comfortable? Yes they are, especially if you can prop your feet on the ottomans in front of them. I've played hours in these chairs. Now the quality, I'm not so sure about. The thing I don't like is the arms. They tend to be really wobbly and loose. The screws on them come loose very easily for some reason, just on the handles. And so I'm constantly screwing them back in with my fingers. One of these days I'm going to go back in there with a wrench and see if I can tighten them up enough so that they don't come loose. They do lean back, but I don't use that function. And they do have some lumbar support and they have a head support pillow which I don't use. I'd rather have my head all the way back as far as it can go. Now there's been a history of chairs in this room. I used to have large lazy boy type chairs and those were very comfortable but they just took up a lot of space and they were not easy to scoot around so I just moved them to my living room. But anyway that's all I have to say about the furniture in the room. Let's move on. So let's talk about the carpet and the decorations. For the carpet, I installed all gray carpet tiles. I used to have it be a black and gray pattern. Don't get black carpet because it shows dirt too easily. So carpet tiles are pretty easy to install if you can get the surface clean and if you don't have a lot of stuff sitting in the way. But you obviously need to get to every corner of the room. These I did not get from Amazon. I ordered them directly from a website, which I'll put on the screen right now. These are very cheap. But they're also very thin, so they're only about as half as thick as regular carpeting. Not all carpet tiles are like that. If you want to spend more, you can get some really, really thick carpet tiles. To install them, I just peeled off the sticker backing and put them on the floor. So let's talk about the two banners I have. I have a PlayStation banner and an Atari banner. And I can't quite remember where I ordered these from. They were either off eBay or from some other website. For the Atari banner, I basically hung it on the red curtain that's blocking the window. And for the PlayStation 1, I just hung it in the back closet. There's obviously a lot of posters in the room too. You can consider these bootleg. They are not official posters made by Sega or whoever. You can find them for sale on eBay. There's tons of them. It's pretty self-explanatory. You just order the poster and then you buy a frame and you put it in the frames and you hang it on the wall. There's a lot of posters that are old games like Super Nintendo games and Genesis games. They also make them for modern games as well. So be sure to check it out. There's also a Nintendo sign and a Sega sign, and I think I bought both of those off Etsy. So that's all I have to say about the carpet and the decor. Let's move on to the next chapter. You've reached the final chapter and I'm going to cover labeling and I have a label maker. I'll put the model number on the screen and I use this to label everything in the room. I have a number system set up for the systems. I have the numbers below each system. I have them on the switch boxes and I have them on the rack mount power supplies. So it's really easy to turn something on and get the signal to the TV using the number system. I also make labels for all the other little devices like chargers and stuff like that. So that's all I have to say about labeling. So let's move on to my final thoughts. So 
So thank you for making it to the end. I don't know if you watched the whole thing, but if you did, you are a sport and you deserve a reward. Um, it got a little technical there, but I hope you enjoyed me sharing this with you. And if you're going to create your own game room, I wish you the best of luck. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. I will be watching these comments a lot in case there are any technical questions because I like to answer those. And also be aware that there are links to a lot of the items that I discussed in the description. Thanks again for watching this video. I'll see you next time.